Hey everyone, my name is Joel, and I want to welcome you to a live Fellowship Church online. If this is your first time with us, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for investing your time with us, and we know you're going to enjoy your experience. In just a few moments, Pastor Wendell is going to be talking about setbacks. We are living during a time that it seems like every time we turn around, we are facing another setback. But in Christ, we can experience victory. Now we're about to get to that message, but before we do, we want to say thank you for giving to Alive FC. You can go to our website, alivefc.org, and follow the prompts to continue to give. So thank you if you are giving. Now here's an important date for you, church. In just two weeks, on August 16th at 4 p.m., we are going to be having an Alive FC kickoff worship service. It's going to take place at Emmanuel Baptist Church at 1201 Hawkins. And yes, this isn't a change in location, but we had a church offer to bless us with their location instead of the party hall. We're going to be practicing social distancing and all other guidelines set by our city leaders, so you will not want to miss a live FC's worship kickoff at Emmanuel Baptist Church at 1201 Hawkins. Again, that's on August 16th at 4 p.m. We hope to see you there. Now, let's join Pastor Wendell. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Alive Fellowship Church. We're glad that you have joined us today for our online service. We want to thank you for being a part of what God is doing at Alive uh, FC. Well, we're into our second official week as a church that is meeting online during the COVID-19 crisis, and we continue to look forward to God's direction uh, for our Northeast campus location. Please continue to pray for us as we seek God's moving in the days, weeks, and months uh, to come. Now, this morning, I, uh, I want to take a few minutes and talk about setbacks. Uh, maybe you've had a setback in your family, in, in a relationship, uh, at work, or maybe even a health issue. Uh, a preacher once said this, and he was certainly correct, the Christian life involves challenges and conflicts, whether we like it or not. Now, doesn't it seem like our enemies are constantly waging war against us, uh, trying to keep us from enjoying the life that, that Christ has for you and I? The world, the devil, and let's be honest, even our own flesh appear to be united against Christ and, of course, His people. Now, in Joshua, in Joshua chapter 6, we see an incredible story of a victory of God's people. The hearts of the people at this time are filled with joy because they have this great victory over Jericho. Now, let me give you a little background. You'll remember Jericho was tightly locked down, but God told Joshua, I'm going to give you Jericho. I'm going to give you its king and its people. So Joshua does exactly what the Lord tells him. He marches around Jericho, and on the seventh day, what does he do? He marches around seven times, and the walls come down. Everything is destroyed except for Rahab and her family. Why? They were spared because she protected some spies. I mean, what a great victory that God gave them. You know, there is nothing that tastes as sweet as victory in the light of great opposition or odds that are just stacked against you and I. Now, Think about Israel at this time. Israel had seen the Lord do for them what they could never have done for themselves. But from the very light of this victory at Jericho, on the very heels of this victory at Jericho, comes a very, very sad and dark defeat. And so they have this great victory at Jericho, and then all of a sudden they have a, a horrible loss. In Joshua chapter 7, we see a great contrast that is in one three-letter word. It's the word, but. It's like when somebody tells you, hey, you're doing a great job, but. Uh, uh, honey, your grades are awesome in all your classes, but. The people of God had been uh, completely victorious they, in crossing the Jordan. So they were victorious in crossing the Jordan. Entering the land, they were victorious. Uh, living at Gilgal, and then the defeat of Jericho. So they had victory upon victory upon victory. And I think Joshua was used to this. No more defeats. We're never going to lose anymore. But... 
this three-letter word. A, a major defeat comes to Joshua on the heels of the victory at Jericho and the other victories at the hands of a very small enemy. What happened? Did God desert them? Uh, was God just unable to deal with this powerful enemy in the new land? Uh, did God mean for them to experience unbroken victory? Now, this defeat at Ai, uh, that's the name of the place, was the only defeat they suffered in their conquest of the land of Cana. Uh, now, church, it's God's desire that you and I don't ever experience defeat. But... God does not make it impossible for His followers to sin that can lead to defeats or setbacks. However, He always makes it possible for us not to sin. It, it's our choice. Defeats or setbacks may happen in a Christian's life. They will, but they don't have to. You see, when a Christian wants God's best, when a Christian wants God's best for their life, a Christian will never be satisfied with past victories. And that's what happened to Joshua. Now, as a result of that, a Christian would not hide in a bunker after a great victory. A follower of Christ walking with Christ will keep climbing higher to higher ground. But just know that as you do, the storms of life will hit you with more force than ever before. Now, in this story, I like Joshua's passion. Uh, his passion to, to charge out for another victory. But what happened to him is what happens to so many of us who are filled with passion and only put confidence in the flesh. We have the idea that we did it. It, it wasn't God. All of those victories, it was because of me. So today, I want to share with you some reasons why Israel failed, why they lost this little battle after unbelievable victories, and why we also might lose. And we're also going to discover maybe some cures for setbacks. So let's get into this. First of all, one of the reasons that they, they failed and they lost is because of overconfidence. And that can happen to you and I, kind of self-confidence. Take a look at Joshua chapter 7, verses 2 and following. The Bible says this, Joshua sent, to get ready for this, this battle, Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho to spy out the town of Ai. This was the next town they were going to conquer. East of Bethel, near beth -Avon. When they returned, they told Joshua, there's no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack. Since there are so few of them, don't make all of our people struggle to go up there. So approximately, the Bible says, 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear uh, at this turn of events, and their courage melted away. They were overconfident. There was a presumption and arrogance in the form of pride. Israel was filled with self-confidence and pride because of their past successes. But that arrogance, that self-confidence, that pride was based on the fact that they had just captured Jericho. Ah, it's not that big of an army. We can defeat them. I mean, think about it. All they actually had done at Jericho was walk around and shout. It was God who had taken the city. Remember this, church. There is no experience in the Christian life so full of danger as a flesh victory. Thinking that I did it. That it was me. A life fellowship church is not about me. It's about all of you. It's about all the people that are coming together. It's always at those moments that we begin to take pride in ourselves and boast that it was our strength that brought the victory. Fear and pride do different things to us, and either one of them can bring defeat. Fear is like a magnifying glass that makes a problem appear greater than it really is. And on the other hand, pride will blind us. It can cause us to think that the problem is much smaller than it really is. And the fact is that apart from the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ, the smallest temptations would be too powerful for us. Isn't it strange what a false sense of power 
we can get when God allows us to experience a victory. Now, now remember, remember what Paul said talking about our sin in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. And I know that nothing good lives in me. And, and then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, church, one of the greatest causes of failure in a Christian life is imagining that the victory that God has given us somehow gives us so much pride to think that we will win every battle. Every spiritual battle that you fight will be different. And if you try to win today's battles with the pride of yesterday's victory, you will experience AI in your own life. Be careful of self-confidence. It is usually the first step to defeat. Whether it's financial, work-related, a position-related, we could apply this to any area of the Christian life. I, I was thinking, if God blesses a, a message that I might preach or some preacher might preach or a song or a, a service with great results and we rejoice in the victory over Satan and what happens in somebody's life, we should. But that does not give us the right to think that it will always be that way. Next week's message, next week's service will take more time, will take more prayer. It will take more study overconfidence. Now, another reason we might experience failure or setback is neglected prayer. Uh, here is what I found after reading uh, the passage in Joshua. In Joshua chapter 3, just before the Israelites crossed the Jordan, the Bible says that, that the Lord told Joshua. Now, that implies that Joshua and, and the Lord, they, they were talking. And in Joshua chapter 6, just before the walls of Jericho, this march, the Bible says that the Lord said to Joshua. Now, once again, that implies that they are talking, that there is prayer going on, that there is communication going on. Now, when you read about this battle of Ai, in the battle of Ai, there is nothing to indicate that Joshua spent time with God. But before this battle took place, there's nothing to show that Joshua failed to meet with God. If only he would have gone to God for counsel at the moment of triumph. As soon as they have triumph in Jericho, he would have recognized and discerned immediately that there was sin in his camp. Somebody did something wrong. Now, church, please get this. Failure to pray always makes us hard hearted to sin. Because Joshua failed to pray, he could not discern the foolish counsel of the spies. Remember, he sent out spies to check out the land of Ai. Remember verse 3. When they returned, they told Joshua, there's no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men. There's only a few of them. So what made the counsel of those spies foolish? Well, what was wrong with what they said? Well, for one... If only a small part of the people went up to win the battle, it would have deprived the rest of the, the, rest of the group witnessing the mighty works of God. And also, it was not their place to tell Joshua what to do. That was God's place. It was not their place. They were only to report what they saw. Be very careful of the counsels you seek and the advice you act on. But once you get divine orders as to His will, then it does not matter what people think or say. Obey God. And one of the greatest temptations you will face is to not pray and to thank God for a victory. Why? Because we don't feel like we're in trouble anymore. We've had the victory. The moment of victory should be the moment that we pray. And we thank God for the victory. Then we recognize the next problem needs prayer as well. And church, don't fall into the trap of thinking we don't need to pray for the next problem because we prayed for the past problem and we had a victory. That is a recipe for failure. And the last reason for failure or setbacks is disobedience. Now, before Jericho, everyone was given clear instructions about not taking any of the treasures from Jericho. But one man looked, coveted, and took what God said not to do. But I want you to see something. Notice what God says in verse 11 about this. Now, remember, one man stole the property, but God says this, 
Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. One man stole the property which belonged to God. He had taken the spoils of victory that were, that were to be set apart to the Lord. One individual in the camp had betrayed God's trust, and the verdict from God was not Achan, the guy who did it, not Achan has sinned, Israel had sinned. One man sinned, and many people died because of it. Now, what principle do, do, do we see here? It's this. No individual Christian can sin without it affecting others. When we grow cold in our spiritual life, it lowers the temperature of everybody else around us. And let's not ever think that our life is not that important because we don't have any real position in life or we're not that important or worse yet, we begin to think that my disobedience only affects me. Ephesians chapter 4 it tells us, let us tell the neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And this should remind us that we're all together in this. We're responsible for each other, for the rest of our families, and we should be willing to help each other keep our walks with God pure and on a God-honoring path. Now, we can't miss this. Did you notice the nature of Achan's sin? He took what belonged to the Lord. It's no light matter to steal God's portion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, on the first day of each week you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Church, when we don't give back to God, we commit the same sin as Achan committed. And when we do that, the results are not healthy for us. God's blessings are withheld from His church. We can do more ministry and see more people saved and begin to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. We can also steal time from God. Talents, treasures. Achan thought he could hide, but God saw what he did. You remember Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that nothing in all creation is hidden from God. You see, the reason Israel failed, had a setback after victories, and the reason we also fail is because of pride, self-confidence, uh, and arrogance. We neglect prayer at times, and lastly, disobedience. So then what is the cure? What is the solution? What's the answer? There is only one cure for this problem, and it is found in verse 20 and 21 of Joshua chapter 7. The Bible says this, Achan is confronted. Achan replied, it is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, bar of gold, weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. They are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. What was Achan doing? He was confessing. The only cure for sin is confession. Now, Achan's confession was only due to the fact that he got caught. He had many other chances to confess before this, but he didn't. And all of us have committed the same sin as Achan. We've all taken whatever it might be and then tried to cover it up. And most of us are more afraid of being found out than ashamed of the sin in our hearts. The cost of unconfessed sin is higher than any of us understands. And then look at verse 12. This is why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that were set apart for destruction. And Proverbs 28, 13 tells us that a person who covers the sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses will have mercy. When we have failures and setbacks in our lives, we need to do some looking we need to look for the sin that may have caused it in our hearts. We need to get to the root of the problem. And that's what God told Joshua to do in verse 10. So Joshua finally goes to the Lord, and it's important to know that God heard him, and that is mercy in and of itself. And Joshua came with a broken heart over what took place. God then told him to get to the root of the problem, and that is that sin must be dealt with. We have to confess it. When you and I deal with our sin, we should ask ourselves, well, why did this take place? Why did this happen? What was the cause? The cost of unconfessed sin is higher than any of us understands. And the reason is because we don't understand how holy God is and how much He hates sin.
I, I close with this. I close with the words of Joshua to the hard-hearted Achan in verse 25. Then Joshua said to Achan, Why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And let's pray and ask God to help us stay away from all of this. Dear Jesus, Father, we, we tell you that we love you and we thank you and we praise you for who you are. God, would you help us not to be prideful, not to be overconfident. Uh, God, that we would not have an arrogance about us. Uh, God, would you help us to pray and would you help us uh, not to be disobedient. And Father, please always remind us to confess to you each day. And God, I just ask that you would bless Alive Fellowship Church. And God, we thank you so much for what you're doing in the hearts and the lives of people. And we pray, God, that you would open a door in Northeast for a location, uh, for land and a building and what we're looking to do. God, we pray that you are all over that. I, I want to thank you and praise you for the people that, that, God, you've laid it on their heart to come and be a part of Alive FC. And so, Father, we just rejoice in the hearts and lives of people who have been changed today. In Christ's name. Amen.